Hello everyone. My name is Shadha and I welcome you all to KiwiTech's 808 workshop for startup and entrepreneurs to help them navigate the challenges of starting a business, making it sustainable and taking it to the next level. Today, we have a mentor session on how to elevate your company's pitch through mobile video. A practical workshop, ladies and gentlemen, due to some unforeseen circumstances, we regret to inform you that Mick Reed will not be joined, will not be able to deliver the workshop today. However, we are delighted to announce that we have a fantastic replacement in the form of Glenn Milkahi, co-founder Mimi Mojo, who will be stepping in to share his expertise with us, and Amy McCauley, VP, VC, and Corporate Partnerships at KiwiTech. I'm super excited to introduce KiwiTech a one-of-a-kind innovation ecosystem that's home to 500 plus portfolio startups and 300 plus mentors, all committed to supporting innovators globally. It all began in 2009 when a team of seasoned entrepreneurs who had previously built and scaled a publishing services company for a nine-digit exit decided to start another company to empower startups with innovation. Without further ado, I would now like to invite Glenn Malkahi, co-founder at Mimojo Co. and Amy McCauley, VP, VC, and Corporate Partnerships at KiwiTech. The screen is all yours. Thanks, Shabon. Hey, Glenn. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're really excited about this event. Um, so let me just get started by talking about the importance of a pitch and a pitch deck. So a pitch is a concise and persuasive speech that introduces your product or service to your target audience. It's an essential component of any business and it's often the first opportunity startup entrepreneurs have making a lasting impression on potential customers, investors, and partners. A good pitch can help you stand out in a crowded market and showcase your unique selling points and ultimately lead to more business opportunities and investment opportunities. In today's fast paced, never changing market, businesses are constantly seeking new and innovative ways to differentiate themselves and grab the attention of potential customers, potential customers, sorry. Um, one trend that has emerged in recent years is the increasing use of mobile video to create compelling pitches that engage and resonate with audiences. By leveraging mobile video, businesses can tell their stories visually, showcase their products or services in action, and cre create an emotional connection with their audience. For best practices in creating an effective pitch to, so basically you want to, for a successful pitch, the best practices are basically keeping it short and concise and focusing on the most important aspects of your business or product highlighting your unique selling points and explaining how your product or service can solve your target audience's problem. Telling a compelling story that resonates with your audience and creates an emotional connection. Using visu visuals such as mobile video to support your message and bring your pitch to life is incredibly important these days. So to end it up so I can hand it over to an expert, um, the pitch is an essential, an, an essential component. And so moving forward, you should really think about how you're going to present yourself in front of your, your target audience and investors. And so I'm going to hand the mic over to Glenn Mulcahy. Hey, hi, another Irish one, Amy McCauley, Glenn I Mulcahy. I was going to ask you the, the whole back history of the Macaulay name, but anyway, not for today, I guess. But anyway, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> we should have a pint. Um, so anyway, I'm going to hand it over to Glenn, who is the expert. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks so much, Amy. That's great. Well, hi, folks. Again, apologies on behalf of Mick uh, that he couldn't make it. I think he's literally um, in the air on a flight at the moment, and then his schedule got a bit messed up. But anyway, apologies. Hopefully, I can still give you some useful and valuable takeaways, and uh, we can always follow up with some um, comments or questions at the end, if you like. Um, so I'm going to dive into the deck, if that's okay with you all. Hopefully uh, you're seeing the summary page, just a little bit of what we're going to kind of cover in the next 30 odd minutes. And I will leave some room at the end then to take some questions from any of you who might have some. And um, just be warned, because uh, it is all about mobile and interactivity. Um, I've included some QR codes in the deck. So if you have your phone on standby, 
And if you switch on the camera application, most, not all, but most smartphones will allow you to scan that QR code so you can actually get access to those resources there and then. But don't worry, I will make the deck available afterwards. So if you miss it, you can always scan after the fact and catch up then as well. And so like I say, Mick uh, can't make it, but apologies, he was due to do this session. We've been working on my mojo at this stage for nearly two years, actually. And it kind of fits in very nicely into the whole mobile ecosystem. But we're not here to talk about my mojo today. We're here to talk about mobile content creation in the context of the pitching video. And I want to set it up in the context of, um, first of all, unblocking people's perception, perhaps, that mobile video is that shaky stuff that you see on social media all the time, and it really is not good enough for pro professional applications. In other words, lots of people tell me that there's always a risk that it could actually do more harm to your brand than actually good for your brand, particularly if you execute it badly. So with that in mind as a kind of a starting point, I just want to give you a tiny quick recap over the last 13 odd years, because as you well know, Mobile video is not new by a long chalk, but there have been some very interesting kind of milestones over that entire period. And probably one of the first ones I would have personally come across was way back in 2014, where the first full feature length film was shot on a couple of iPhones. A guy called Ricky Fosh and I made a piece called Uneasy and Uneasy Lies the Mind. And that is still available to download on iTunes today. And it was very interesting in the sense we talk about, you know, perhaps trying to raise capital and get venture and investment. He went to Kickstarter and he basically crowdfunded the entire production. And similar to what we're going to discuss today, his whole idea was he did a pitching video. As you will often see in crowdfunded platforms, there's a video that introduces exactly what it is, the product is, or what the, the actual outcome will be, talks a bit about the rewards, about the team and everything. And we're going to unpack all those things. Amy has already effectively kind of given us a checklist of things to look at. So that was way back 2014. Then a couple of years later, we had a movie called Tangerine which basically managed to skewer a $1 million um, dollar fund um, from Magnolia Pictures, and it ended up in cinemas, in art house cinemas, specifically around the world. And it was a real kind of a breakthrough moment because up until then, people would often argue about the quality of content coming off smartphones, say it's not very good, it may be okay for the internet, but that's it. Well, if you can put it up on a 40 foot screen in a cinema, you know, the quality might actually be more than that quality. It might actually be more than good enough. And I will tell you, my background is in broadcast TV. I've been in TV for 20 years. And certainly we started broadcasting content for smartphones all the way back in 2012. And so it's come a very, very long way. And then the last milestone just to mention to you is Steven Soderbergh who has done several productions on smartphones. But again, probably the most notable one about five years ago now is one called And Uneasy Lies the Mind. Sorry, Unsane. That was it. Um, and this is him in production, guys. It doesn't have to be huge trucks and lots and lots of camera and lots and lots of lights. It can be as low key as this. Yeah, step back. Just be Directing on and the fly. And, and by the way, he's not using a wheelchair because he moved it. He's using the wheelchair because it's right, a yeah. smooth and tracking shot rather than having the higher end Panavision tracks. So a bit of innovation, thinking outside the box, but content that ultimately led to a feature film that was in cinemas all over the world. Okay, so... Let's try and debunk this theory straight out the box that um, smartphones are not good enough for broadcast. Technically, smartphones, in some cases, certainly the latest generation of iPhones, some of the good Samsungs and Sonys, et cetera, they've effectively surpassed broadcast quality. But let me just give you this as a kind of a starting point. I can give a 50,000 euro broadcast camera to someone who does not have a clue about how to do a structured story or is not a good visual storyteller and they're going to give me, forgive my language, but crappy pictures because they just don't know what they're doing with the camera. Even though it's a spanking top of the range broadcast camera, the actual media that you get out of it will be somewhat useless. OK, now, if you flip that model on its head, and this is what I will cover with you in the latter part of this session, I'm going to give you some of the most common mistakes and I'm going to give you pointers and things to make sure you avoid them so you don't fall into those same common pitfalls. So we'll talk a bit about structure in the way that you film. I'll give you some tips on apps and gear, and we'll talk a little bit on presenting or interviewing to camera as well, which I think is a really, really important skill. And certainly post COVID, I think all of us have had to do it, whether we like it or not. But again, there's things you can do to kind of up your game and make it that little bit more slick and professional. So in my experience in the mobile space, I mean, I've trained multiples of thousands of people across the, the mobile ecosystem, brand, brands like BBC, Al Jazeera and other big news brands. And I mean, I always try to show people the vast gamut of media content creation that you can do with a phone. Most people have, they just keep thinking, oh, the phone, you know, it's, it's a great camera. You can take good pictures. I can shoot some video, the family birthdays. But that so underestimates the true potential of the device. And with just a few apps, you can literally open up a huge gamut of professional content once you know what you're doing. 
So personally, I show people basically presenting skills, interviewing, how to launch and basically create your entire podcast series with just your phone, screen recorded tutorials, box pops on the streets or testimonial videos, lots of social media posts. In fact, I occasionally literally work for clients to create social media content at um, social events or corporate social responsibility gigs. Then there's the whole world of live streaming. And of course, in the space that we're in um, uh, for, for businesses as well, there's a huge opportunity to just get very slickly produced little kind of quote cards and little small social videos out of the market as well. So that's a, that's the gamut of it. Now let's try and hyper-focus in a little bit, if you like, on the whole idea of your pitching video and what are the do's and don'ts and things to watch for. So Amy's already kind of given us the checklist. You know probably some of these stats. You know, the video, it offers a huge amount of additional um, opportunity beyond just text on the page. And a huge part of that is basically storytelling, visual storytelling, okay? Because it's more engaging to the audience. It's more interesting to the audience. And if you're willing to put yourself on camera, people will basically also assess you as an individual. They read your body language. They'll read into the tone of voice and your presentation. And everything is all part of this huge world of communication. That little small thing in your pocket potentially can open up a huge world of opportunity. Video, of course, increases stickiness. It will improve your brand, particularly if you include your logo. Um, it's an impre incredibly powerful storytelling tool, even for short form video. Again, I do a lot in that particular space for news organizations trying to pivot from TV into the social space. And again, this is the one thing to remember. Unlike the written word, video resonates emotionally. You know, people actually really, really like to kind of watch other people. You know, we're all kind of innately programmed to do this from birth almost. Um, and it brings a level of personal and authentic kind of value to what it is that you're trying to convey. So the other opportunities in there is you want to try and get the audience to go to the next step. You want to basically have a call to action in there somewhere so that you entice them in. It is a lure. It's not quite an advert. It's basically just enough to tease them so that they want to find out more. You know, you want to spark their curiosity. You want to give them a bit of the story, but not everything. If it's overwhelming, you lose them. So you have to be very, very careful. As Amy rightly said, you want to keep it quite short and snappy. And I'm going to give you some tips and do's and don'ts of what to include basically in your video as well. So keep it short and sweet and leave other information. Leave it so that there's more to find out at the end of the video so that you're not trying to cram too much in. OK, so in my experience, again, social video. It can run from anything of just a couple of seconds, maybe up to about a minute. There is a bit of a, a cliff in, in social video uh, storytelling. Around 60 seconds, you lose about 50% of your audience, and it goes downhill rapidly after that. So shorter is definitely better. But with pitching videos, it's slightly different because hopefully this is someone who's going to be invested in what it is that you're trying to basically share with them. So they're going to give you an extra little bit of time. So two to three minutes is a fairly good guideline. I'd be trying to keep it towards the two minutes if you can keep it concise and keep all this kind of information in there. And the key bullet points, if you want, you want to include in that video are as follows. So we want an introduction. You don't just hop in and start bombarding the loads of information. You want to basically tease in a little bit about who you are, who the company is, and a little bit about your backgrounds. And then Marketing 101, we want to talk about the problem. What is the problem that you're effectively trying to bring a solution to market for? And then what is your solution? If it is a tangible product, we want to try and show that product. And then obviously we want to try and expand a little bit to tease where the future lies. Like how big is the, the market? Who are the people behind this product? How much can you trust that they will actually do what we're saying we're doing in the video? And then, as I say, just tease a little bit of a call to action at the end, basically, so that they're going to want to learn more. They're going to want to follow up with you. Okay, Don't give it all away straight out of the gate. So let's unpack these just very, very quickly, one by one. In your intro video, keep it short again. Who are you? What does your company do? Okay. If you have branding, ideally you should, when you're trying to get it out of the gate, we want some sort of recognition and um, brand recognition. So include your logo on it. And by the way, in the apps that I show you later, you have the full gamut of, of productivity. You have six layers of video. You can add in your graphics and everything into the actual package as well. And um, so it's all, you can do the whole thing just on your phone. You don't need to go off to a laptop or to a big desktop computer anymore. Um, and that's a really, really important uh, tip for you. You have about seven seconds, between three and seven seconds to gain the viewer's interest and to kind of hook them in. So make the first couple of seconds of your pitching video really, really punchy. In, in news storytelling, we talk about this idea, best shot first. Show something that's literally, if, it, if you were to do a snapshot that was going to sum up everything in this video in one image, put that at the start. So slap them in the face, get their interest, and then kind of unpack it, like I say, in those morsels that we're discussing, okay? So right up front, once you've said who you are, you want to delve into the problem. What is it? How relevant is it? What's the solutions that are currently on the market? 
why does this problem exist? So context and background for it, and then any sort of metrics or anything that you might have to kind of reinforce that messaging. But you do want to keep it simple. Avoid going huge, big detail graphs and things like that, like simple storytelling. And in many ways, in the same way with decks, even though I'm breaking every rule of the book right now, you'll see in a minute, um, keep the amount of text or anything included in it to a minimum, as much as you possibly can. Keep it visual because the body likes to actually, and the eyes like to process that information rather than just read. We tend to actually miss things when we're just skimming through or reading things. So then the true heart of this pitching video, your solution. Okay. And this is the passion part of it. This is where you want to have your hero images. Again, we'll talk a little bit about the actual way that you're going to film these in a minute, but again, describe your solution. How will the customer feel? So bring emotional connection into the actual video. It's really, really important. And then what are the other benefits? You know, what are the, the additional kind of benefits of actually using your product or your solution? And again, realistic kind of imagery we don't want it to be you know the halo effect we want it to look real but it should also be very very impressive so be careful about the type of music and things that you choose as well and um, there's loads of great music services out there i personally like premiumbeat.com i'm not on commission from them it's just i like the musicians and the artists on there and they have some very very clever ways of chopping up the sounds so you can use it basically to build a crescendo in line with the way that your video is coming together so have a look at that one as well if it's a product then we want to actually, as much as possible, give a concise example or demonstration of how the product actually works. And I'm going to give you a frame of reference for this shortly, a simple kind of checklist for the type of shots that you could consider recording. That way, once you go to edit the actual piece, you're going to have continuity. You're going to have lots of visual interesting angles to kind of show from different perspectives to keep people interested. And I'll give you a few tips on pacing and how to keep shot dynamic as well as we move along. Um, is this viable? Let's talk about the competitive space, but really, really careful. Try not to repeat any of the information that you've already given away. That's a real turn off. And, you know, particularly when people are watching videos online, it's just one click to move on to the next story, or the next piece of content. So don't don't preamble, don't wander off, stay on topic, keep it really, really focused. And I would personally say, if you've never edited your media before, never, ever publish the first draft. OK, so you want to basically edit a piece, give it everything, believe that it's perfect. Then you want to basically put it down go away, sleep on it, come back the next day and revisit it and see where's the opportunity for tightening it up or perhaps taking some content out there that's a little bit fluffy, a little bit woolly and unnecessary. That's the nice process of iterating in the edit process, okay? And then you obviously want to try and define growth. If these people are investing in your product, they want to know that there's a market opportunity that's going to basically give them a return their investment. So you want to demonstrate the market research that you've done to show where the growth is. That's the, that's the one buzzword above all else. Every time I've spoken to someone who's in, in interested in investing, they all want to see the growth projections for the actual product. So bear in mind that you will need basically do some market research in this space um, and also profile the users, who are the personas that you're targeting basically for this product as much as you can possibly and um, give them in detail. Again, keep it visual as much as you possibly can. It is a really good idea, in my opinion, and if you've gone to platforms like Kickstarter, as I mentioned earlier, you will often see that the key individuals that are involved in the company will basically form part of that pitching video that you might see on Kickstarter or the like. And I think that's actually really good. You get a sense of who these people are, you understand their kind of pedigree and the sort of projects that they've done before. And that should hopefully help to instill confidence in people that these guys really, or girls, really know what they're doing. They have a, a completely sort of um, a tangible background, a proven track record, and these are people that you're, you're going to want to actually work with. So a previous record of success, really, really useful. Also, put people on camera. Again, people are, you know, we, you know, it's a visual communication is all about not just the, the pictures, but the sound as well. So give people a line that they kind of pitch towards the actual camera so that the person actually on the receiving end hears them, gets a sense of who they are, gets a sense of their personality. All that comes across within just a few seconds of witnessing people on screen. So I know not everyone loves that. You know, people are a bit un uncomfortable with that, perhaps. But again, the legacy of two years of quarantine and lockdown, and everything is, is that we've all had to get used to this to being on camera, to presenting. So it's a good idea to put that into practice again as well in your pitching video. And then as you come towards the end of the video, you've kind of established all the key markers and everything, but always make sure that there's a nice hook at the end. So a call to action that basically is trying to draw the person on to do something else to basically, you know, get in contact with you, look for more information, but basically you want to give them a nice hook towards the end, keep them interested and lure them on to further information. And this is where you can draw a line between the essential items that should be included in the pitching video and where the additional deeper dive information is going to be available upon request. OK, so, you know, save that for the end. Don't overload the video because if it gets boring, you've lost them completely and you've blown it effectively. 
Yeah. So what not to include. So there's no need to put information about your competitors. You don't need to do financials, strictly speaking. Yes, you want to show market growth, but that may just be a graph as opposed to detail kind of analytics and spreadsheets. Don't do that. Business plan, save it for conversations and discussion. Yeah, don't try and sum it all up in one video. And your, your um, strategy for customer acquisition, again, topics to be discussed in depth once they move past the first phase, and that is getting to the end of your video and knowing where the hooks are. Okay, so save all those until a little bit further down the line. Now, I said it would be practical. So now let's talk a little bit about how you're actually going to physically make these videos. And I don't just mean the apps and the hardware. Let's just talk about structure and the key skills that you need in order to be able to make a really good, impactful video. OK, so there's just key elements that you need to be comfortable with. I'll unpack these and I'm going to give you some videos to kind of refer back to as well. But ones to watch out for, because again, speaking to camera, I personally think it's got huge value. It's a piece of content in its own right. So your founders, anyone who basically is potentially already an investor willing to give you a testimonial, let's see them. Yeah, let's get them in front of the camera. We want to make sure that we use decent lighting. We don't want them shot against the window and stuff. But again, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a second. The editing application I'm going to mention to you shortly will easily allow you to add your voice over the video sequences that you shot. So you don't necessarily have to have someone trying to narrate everything as they go. In fact, it's much, much easier in the editing process if you just worry about capturing the visuals and then you can add sound and voiceover and you can lift the sound from interviews and underlay that over the sequences uh, all in the edit process. So keep the filming as much as you can, keep the filming pretty simple and save a lot of the audio production for the edit process later. That obviously doesn't apply to interviews. You want to get the sound during the interviews. So product sequences I'm going to unpack for you in a moment. I'll give you the kind of top tips for how to approach the filming of that. I've talked to you a little bit about B-roll of your team. So those are just general shots around your office. I mean, a little bit of action of people doing things just gives people a sense of the kind of, you know, the environment that you're working in, the dynamic of the group. And also, if you follow this little recipe I'll give you in a second, it's going to give you lots of really good, interesting shots to edit. Um, might be value in showing the location where you're based, you know, if it's relevant to your product, then definitely include that, but get your logo in there, get your branding into the actual background. Like I say, you can add it in as graphic elements as well, but in your office space, if you have your brand in the background, again, that's just reinforcing the branding, which makes it look that bit more professional as well. And again, if you have an example of the problem, you can capture that in a sequence, and then you can demonstrate how your solution basically addresses that problem again all based on this concept of sequences. So let's just skip on to this idea. This is the, the two kind of filming um, techniques that you will often see employed. I would ultimately separate them into two different things. They're ultimately defined by control above all else. So I often deal with people in newsroom environments and you have two different types of stories, breaking news stories where you have zero control. You just have to capture the best that you can in that moment in time. And then the flip side of that is what I would call a kind of a planned or a staged sequence where there is someone who's collaborating with you. You have time on your side. And to a certain extent, you also have control of the environment. So if you had to ask someone to repeat an action or to do something again, that's no big deal. That's perfectly fine. In a live or a run and gun environment, that's much, much more difficult. Now, there is one school of thought that says that when you do the actual plan stuff, that it doesn't feel as authentic. I would say that having trained thousands of people, it is certainly easier and usually gives better results in the first version. So if you're complete out of straight out of university and have just picked up your phone for the first time you're about to shoot, then I would strongly encourage you to go towards the kind of planned stage sequence type uh, filming uh, style because it's just simpler and it's going to give you more editable content. So have the time to kind of practice, like I say, and plan those shots. You could use a storyboarding app on your phone if you really want to. I prefer to work organically. I prefer to observe a scene of what's known as a master shot. So if someone is doing something, maybe they're making a product, maybe they're fine tuning something at circuit board level, I'll observe first and I'll get a wide shot, a shot that kind of takes the person in, the environment in, everything that's in that scene establishes the location. But then I want to get into the detail. So I'll move from that wide shot into a mid shot which is typically from the navel to the top of the head, or perhaps a medium close-up from the chest line to the top of the head. And that brings me as the viewer from the corner of the room right up close to the individual. We're on a little bit of a journey now. We're moving closer to this human. And then I will look for the close-up of the hands. I want to see the detail of what they're doing, whether that's coding, whether that's soldering, whether that's making, whatever it is, if it's been done with the hands, I want to see a really good granular close-up shot. And this is one of the first things that people make a mistake in which is that they say a close-up is, you know, this distance away from something. It's not. If people are going to consume this content in your smartphone and they're using a really, really small screen, you know, small little screen, 
you want to make sure that you actually use proper close up. So I mean, get your phone right in to about five to six inches away from the actual action. Make sure you get your focus and exposure right on whatever it is that's happening and then just roll for 10 seconds. OK, each shot, just 10 seconds. That's all you need. And you're not going to use those 10 seconds in the edit. You're only going to use maybe four or five of them. But nonetheless, you'll have more than enough to be able to edit, trim around and make sure that you have actually usable content from that. OK, so we've done our wide shot, which sets up where we are. We've done our mid shot, that sets up who the person is that we're filming now. We've done the close up shot, which gives us the what is the action in this particular sequence or this particular scene. Now, what we want to do is get some emotion. And in order to get the emotion, you simply turn the camera away from what the actual object of, of interaction is with the hands. And let's see the person's face full tilt in whatever it is that they're doing. So they're invested in whatever it is they're doing. I want to see that expression on their face. Are they pensive? Are they happy? Are they, do they look stressed? Do they look really, really, you know, kind of bored? Maybe not that one, but you get what I mean. The shot of the face is going to give us the emotion in that moment. And that is a really, really important thing for that kind of that, that emotional connection with the audience. We want to see this person working hard to basically get this the best that it can possibly be. And then we often use this methodology called the five shot sequence. So we've done four wide shows where mid shot shows who close up shows what the action is. The reverse angle shot of the face shows the emotion. And then the fifth shot is what we often call an arty or a creative shot. And you can basically just put the phone somewhere interesting, fun. You know, it could be perhaps under a product where the person's looking down. It might be under a microscope where we can actually physically see the person kind of dialing in something. It's something that is a unique shot that you couldn't actually get with a much, much bigger broadcast camera. A, a unique perspective that is mobile only. Shots like that will actually give you a really interesting and quirky kind of angle that when you're watching it back, can be like a flick on the ear just to get your attention reinvested in the video. It's a useful little trick. I would try and do one of those trick shots every time I'm doing a sequence, every time I'm trying to create some level of continuity. So I've put together a little simple piece. It's it's my ever suffering better half and um, just about to take off in my car for the day. Hopefully you will see the variety of the shots and you will also get a sense of exactly how the continuity in this works once you bring it all into the edit. Have a look. You might say, well, there's shots in there that are completely unnecessary. For instance, why do we need to see the close up of her zipping up her jacket? Or why do we need to see the close up of the key? The point about it is when you're doing the filming part, get all of those shots so that when you get to the editing part, you can make an informed decision on what you include and exclude. Because editing is not actually about which buttons you press to do things, editing is about how you structure and how you pace the actual piece of content. So hopefully, one thing that you got from that piece is that it flowed with continuity fairly continuously. There might have been a few little tight cuts in there, but nonetheless, the essence of it is it feels as though there's multiple cameras following or doing one action. When in fact, obviously, I did every single one of those shots for 10 seconds each, and it took probably 20 minutes to record the whole thing. OK, so it does take a bit of time, but it does give you a lot of variety of shots in the edit. And that's what you're ultimately aiming to achieve. And one tip here. You might have noticed that as I was filming that, I wasn't doing loads of movement with the camera. I wasn't following the action. I wasn't tracking in. I wasn't doing zooms or anything like that. There is a logic to that, guys, and it's very, very simple. Twofold. Number one, 
it's much, much easier to just think like a photographer and to frame up your shot and let the action happen in front of the camera. Much, much easier. Once you've perfected your skill and you've gotten very, very, very good at visual storytelling, then by all means, you can become the next Cecil B. DeMille and you can start to do tracking shots or good fellow pans or whatever else it is. That's all fine. But if you're starting out, honestly, static shots, for the most part, are going to give you the most editable footage. Just remember that as a quick tip. Now, I have another little video to share with you, which gives you some additional kind of things to watch out for when you're filming for the first time. I actually used this during COVID lockdown and I was asked to basically work on a documentary with a group where they had 25 people around the world, all self-filming, and they basically sent all their content through me basically for the edit for that documentary. And it was all about their experience of quarantine in different parts of the world. But these were the tips that I gave them for using their smartphones to shoot content themselves to be included in a broadcast television documentary. So as I say, that was a video that we basically used to uh, create a documentary from people under uh, quarantine around the world. Now, there's a couple of tips in there that actually go ahead and cover off uh, some of the techniques that I would typically use for shooting interviews as well. For instance, like the headroom, the space above the head, positioning of the microphone, all those sort of things. But here's the QR codes. So that video, if you want to scan that QR code right now, or if you want to scan it from the deck afterwards, you can look back over that video and get some more of the details. Amy might appreciate the hack with the elastic band and the whiskey bottle. That put more people on air during COVID than I can even begin to count. Uh, I actually have to credit a guy called John McHugh for coming up. That one's very, very clever. And um, I have a separate video for filming interviews specifically, but I'm not going to play that now because that runs nearly four minutes and I think we're nearly out of time. So what I'm going to do is again, give you the actual QR code so that you can scan that and you can watch that video as well. And it gives you a checklist of things to watch out for 
when you're filming an interview or filming yourself presenting to camera so that you basically make it look slick and professional and don't fall into any of the traditional kind of pitfalls or traps. Now, I'd like to briefly, just before I run out of time, touch on gear. Um, I'm a bit of a gear head. I have a curtain behind me at the moment hiding all my gear, but there's shelves upon shelves back there with about 10 years of gear behind me. So the good news is I've bought it and tested it, so you don't have to. Um, this is what I actually use in my own kit. And I've shot for broadcasters. I shoot, shoot for social media on a fairly regular basis, and it takes all those boxes. OK, so the first thing is uh, I strongly recommend getting an actual tripod. Um, a tripod basically is going to stabilize your footage and like I say, if you follow that kind of recipe I gave you a minute ago, it's going to give you your solid shots to be able to edit your sequences. And um, I have a kind of a cage, as it's known, or a mount that my phone sits into that allows me to basically put my phone on top of the tripod. But if I want, I can add on additional lenses. And to be fair, with the newer generation, particularly with the iPhone, you have a 2x or a 4x basically zoom lens and there may be an even better one coming so i don't often use add-on lenses anymore so i wouldn't waste money on that at this point unless you have a very specific use case and um, much better would be if you are buying into an ecosystem whether you're samsung or whether you're ios whatever else it is try and get the top of the range device if you can afford it because you'll get all the best latest features including macro mode and low light performance and all those things so Sound is every bit as important as video, and it's the one thing that is often overlooked when it comes to shooting with the smartphone. People just go, oh, there's a microphone on it. It'll be fine. Fine is not good enough. If you wanted to be able to compete with a high-end DSLR or a broadcast camera, all of those folks are taking sound seriously. You need to as well. On my kit, I basically have two solutions. One is number three there on the graph. It basically is a little small microphone that sits on top of my kit. It has a full, what's called a dead cat or wind cover over it. it. Means if I'm filming outside, I get perfect quality sound no matter how windy it is. And then the second one is when I'm doing interviews specifically, I will always put a lav mic, as you saw in the previous video, a lav mic on my guest. And you can, of course, like number five there on the kit, you can basically make that a wireless or a wired solution. I will touch on some of the cheaper solutions in a second as well. But the bottom line is, and remember this, please, when it comes to sound, signal to noise is the essence. Signal is what you want. Noise is what you don't want. So it's really important whenever you're actually shooting an interview that you listen to the background ambient sound and make sure that it's not going to distract from the person. And then the second tip is once you put the lav mic on, if you think about it, the mic microphone on my phone is going to be at least a meter away from the person, if not further. But when you put a lav mic on, the mic is now just six inches away from the sound source right there. And that's why you get much better sound once you have the lav mic on there. Have a look at the video that I showed you about interview techniques because there's a few tips in there to set the level, make sure that you're getting good, clean, crisp sound, okay? And then the last couple of accessories, obviously, there's a light. There's a lot of different lighting options, LED panels and all the rest out there. I would normally go into that in a lot more detail, but for the sake of this, one light and knowing where your natural light is, is usually more than sufficient. So use natural light to your advantage as much as you can. Now, I've added a single page on here, which goes with the graph uh, from the previous one, which lists everything that's on that kit. And by the way, the beauty of mobile is rather than spending, well, you know, 20, 30,000 euros and bringing in an EFP team to shoot the video for you, you can throw some toys into the kit as well and still not break the bank. So if you can up the production value and if you can learn some of these, you know, you can get sliders, gimbals, drones, you name it, basically. There's a huge ecosystem of toys out there um, to potentially up your productivity. Are they essential? Absolutely not. Do they bring some additional value to your videos? For, for instance, you know, if you can get drone shots, as long as you know how to fly it properly, absolutely they do. So if you can afford them, wonderful. Do you need them essentially? No, you absolutely don't. Okay. So again, there's just a few suggestions on additional stuff that you can get. The most common thing I get asked is what is the absolute minimum that I need? There it is. Simple as that phone. And I'm personally an iPhone user, but you might have preferences in the Android space. That's perfectly fine. There, you know, there's some amazing Android cam cameras and phones out there as well, but ultimately the phone, a couple of apps that I'll mention in a moment, a microphone, and ideally some type of monopod or tripod to hold the actual phone steady. That is about as low key as I think you can realistically go. And I do get people often saying, I don't need a tripod. The image stabilization is too good. It's very hard to do an interview where you're holding the phone over here while trying to conduct the interview here to get the right eye line in the video. Um, so yes, a tripod does have value even still. When it comes to apps, there are really just a couple that I use. And these are apps that basically unlock the full potential of your smartphone for making professional quality content. First one of them 
is an editing application called LumaFusion. There are lots of other options out there. So if you have other preferences, that's perfectly fine. The reason I use this particular app is because I have actually used it since before it was even born in the sense that it used to be a product by Avid. And the broadcaster I used to work in was a full Avid house. So uh, the team that built the product when it was part of Avid went off and created LumaFusion. Their editing app called LumaFusion is available on both iOS and Android. So again, you can scan the QR codes if you're interested in buying it. It is a purchase, not a subscription. So unlike an awful lot of the competitors on the market, which have all switched to subscription models and weekly or monthly costs, LumaFusion, you still just buy it once and it is yours. There are some additional in-app purchase features, but they're not essential. Camera-wise, you might think, oh, I'll just use the native camera on my phone. It'll be perfectly fine. But actually, generally speaking, they are not because audio is usually the one thing that is missing in the native camera apps. And I just told you, audio is every bit as important as video. So one app that I've actually used since it started way back in 2011 is an application called Filmic Pro. To give you context, you know the clip I showed you at the top of this deck with Steven Soderbergh making his film? This was the app that Steven Soderbergh used to make that feature film. Um, it's a pro camera. It recently was acquired and they have switched to a subscription model. Uh, but nonetheless, if you are familiar with big broadcast cameras, the 50 euros a year that the subscription for Filmic Pro comes in at is still a bargain basement kind of price. Again, available on both iOS and Android. Now, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just say it one more time. Your smartphones or your mobile ecosystem is not just a camera, it's a complete editing system. And only today, to keep this relevant and timely, Apple came out and announced that shortly, in a matter of weeks, they're going to launch Final Cut Pro on the iPad. So if you're dubious about using third-party apps, maybe you're already a Final Cut user, you'll have the access, if you have a latest generation M1 or M2 iPad, to be able to run Final Cut Pro on it. And it looks like a very sweet user interface. I haven't had hands on myself yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing what it looks like. If what I've shared with you is of interest, like I say, I will share the deck with you again afterwards, but you're welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions. Drop me an email at glenn at mymojo.co or equally you can reach out to Mick, uh, give me the details. But one final thing, because I did tell you to give you a hook at the end of the presentation, well, there's your hook. If you want to scan the actual QR code, you can download a little kind of top tips for mobile production that we've put up on the MyMojo website. You're welcome to download that and have a look through it. That effectively is the course that I've just done for CNN, distilled down to eight pages to give you all the best kind of takeaways and best practices. And that is me. Are there any questions, I wonder, Shivam? Thank you so much, uh, Glenn, for all this information and good, good presentation. I guess Natasha had one question. She wanted a video QR code again, which you mentioned you're going to share uh, the tech with her later afterwards. So she might. So we have the QA open, guys. If you have any questions for Glenn, we're going to wait for around 30 seconds, getting some questions. No problem. I wonder which QR code it was. Probably best if I just send you guys the deck and you can distribute it as a PDF afterwards might be the easiest thing. Thank you. No questions? I might have a question from our team. So uh, what is the best duration for a promotional video? Uh, I get asked that so often, particularly when it comes to social media type content. And I would love to say that there is a perfect number, but there is not. I would be facetious if I said there was. Um, the truth about it is, is that different platforms, depending on where you're going to publish your video, will have different kind of bias. So for instance, what works particularly well on YouTube is not necessarily going to perform so well on something like Instagram or TikTok. So it really is platform specific. And obviously the format of the content that you make is also going to have to be platform specific. In the video I just showed, I recommended that people always shoot in widescreen because it's the most versatile, allows you to basically yeah. put it on websites like Kickstarter and other things. But there is a way, a process where you can actually, if you shoot in very high quality, like 4K, you can cut that content from widescreen to vertical and use it on Instagram or TikTok as well, rather than having to shoot a whole new piece in vertical. So there's, there's a few hacks and techniques that are um, uh, actively used in the kind of mobile journalism market that you could definitely adopt to try and make it a very, very efficient workflow. But I would say shorter is always better. Bear in mind the cliff thing that I said early on about 60 seconds to 90 seconds really is the sweet spot. If you have an engaging piece of content, you can carry people. I mean, I've watched YouTube videos that have run for a whole hour. If the person is giving me value, then I will stick with it. But that's the bottom line. I think it's a case of um, 
yeah, it's a case of, of, of trying to make it as concise as it can possibly be, but without feeling too rushed. Okay, so uh, Natasha has another question uh, for you, Glenn. Uh, when you're interviewing, what's the best way to create an interesting question? Um, so uh, I guess because I come from a journalism background, I'm used to the idea of basically researching the individual in advance, and you might well spend a couple of hours kind of trawling through their background so you can get a sense of who the individual is and where their uh, specialities are. When you're making a promotional piece, though, it doesn't work quite the same in the sense that, you know, you should be collaborating with the individual in front of the camera. So it's not kind of adversarial. You're collaborating in a positive way. So in many ways, in that sense, it makes sense to basically just ask the person, what are the key talking points that they want to cover? Once they've given you the list of talking points, then you restructure that into the questions that lead to those answers kind of naturally and organically. That way it doesn't feel staged. They're still your questions, but they're bringing the individual, oops, they're bringing the individual basically to the specific question that you want, if that makes sense. Um, but it's a great question, you know, so I'd say collaborate, uh, particularly when it's promotional type content. Uh, I, I just see she has actually asked a second one there as well. Can you shoot a documentary um, short on a smartphone with these practices? Yes, you can, Natasha. Let me just tell you, again, a small side story. So in my previous role, I used to be head of innovation in the National Broadcaster of Ireland. And the television production team, uh, every year they used to run a special producer-only course. It was extremely highly sought after, as in 400 people used to apply for just 10 places. And the year that they asked me to come in and collaborate on that course, I did just a three-day workshop on using your smartphone to basically shoot extremely high-quality content. And again, I'm speaking now as a broadcast, former broadcast engineer, so they really had to hit the spec. They needed to be able to go on the TV tomorrow. And what I asked all of them to do is at the end of that course, they were supposed to create a pitching document for a documentary idea that could potentially be commissioned. So in many ways, similar to in a pitch for trying to get money from someone to support your business, they were trying to get money to actually make their documentaries. And three of the team of 10 took everything that I taught them, go back to your question, and basically put it into practice. And of the three, one of them made a two minute teaser promo video, which basically introduced three of the core characters for her piece, she had done beautiful sequences, which I've talked about basically ex explaining exactly what these people do. They were, they were not hoarders. They were natural collectors. They were people who were basically really passionate about coins or stamps, but basically just collect, collect, collect. And she basically really gave a great insight into the kind of psychology and the motivation and the passion of these people. Managed to squeeze it all, all into two minutes and managed to secure 57,000 euros to make her documentary on the back of that two minute video. So yes, you absolutely can. And to go further and say, she went on to make the entire one hour documentary in 4K, all with her phone, because the commissioning editors were so impressed with the quality. They went, well, you did the promo in, in your phone. Why don't you go to the whole series? So if you're interested, I can send you a link to it afterwards. But it was called The Collectors, and it was broadcast on RT television, all made with the phone. Thank you so much, Glenn. I, I had a couple of questions, but you answered it uh, in your uh, previous answers. Uh, my primary questions were, uh, what resolution do you usually recommend when we shoot a video? And should we shoot horizontal or vertical? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll recap it. So at resolution, again, in the video, I showed you uh, that we had set the phone to record just in HD quality, but at a very high megabit rate. So it was actually shooting at 50 megabits per second. Don't want to blind people with the science now, but these are technical standards that you need to hit if you want to put it on the TV. If you're putting it out on social media, though, those rules really don't apply in the same way. So, for instance, just by comparison, if you shoot normal HD on your iPhone, it shoots at about 24 megabits per second, about half the quality, um, but still perfectly fine. And the other thing to always remember, and this was always the, the secret of the broadcast workflow, in broadcast, you spend so much time and so much money on extremely high-end equipment and high bit rates the whole way through the chain, all the way up to delivery. And when it gets to the person's house, it delivers over satellite at four megabits or five megabits per second. So it literally is, it's a constant compression process all the way through to delivery. And that's why, to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter too much how much quality you put upstream on social, because as soon as you upload it, the platform is going to take complete control over how heavily compressed that video is. Personally, I tend to try and shoot using the same kind of broadcast idea, which is start with the highest quality that you can. So if your device supports it, and if you have enough storage space, I would always encourage people to try and shoot in 4K natively. And at least then you have all this amazingly high quality content to begin with. And that allows you the flexibility to do a HD version or even lower quality if you want, or a 2K version and in different shapes and sizes as well. There's a whole kind of strategy for shooting a little bit wider 
and then allowing you to crop into different shapes in the edit process. So it's very, very versatile and very time efficient. So if you can get your head around that, that's a really, really useful strategy to allow you to drop your video into different platforms, pre-formatted to the, the shapes effectively that work best on those platforms. Thank you so much, Glenn, for explaining that. We will take a couple of more questions. So we have one in uh, the q and box. It says, in the age of influencer marketing, what are the best practices that a founder can work around to collaborate? That's a great question. I, I actually know quite a few people. I've had the privilege in the past of interviewing people like iJustine and Superstaff and others who are kind of top of their game. iJustine has about 10 million followers on YouTube. So, yeah. you know, quite the influencer. Um, of all of them, I asked them a couple of the same key questions, very similar to this. Like, what are the keys to success as an influencer marketing person? And it was very much a case of, above all else, absolutely understanding who your tribe is. In other words, be passionate about a topic and know the people that will want to know about that topic. That's your tribe. The second thing is the production values. The thing about an awful lot of YouTubers, if you will, is that they make it look so easy. And yet when you look at behind the scenes videos, you realize the amount of effort that goes into the production of their daily vlogs or videos. I'll give you one example on that one. Uh, I did a course, an online course with Casey Neistat. Again, I think I can't remember how many millions, but gazillions of people basically on YouTube follow him. I did a course with him over the course of a couple of weeks last year and watching him edit, even though it was pre-recorded, watching him edit for two hours was almost like an epiphany for me. I honestly sat back in awe of the man watching the way that he worked, this thought process, the way that he structured things. So what I would actually say to you is rather than try to necessarily kind of... Um, to copy their style or their productions techniques, I would row it back a little bit because that's where an awful lot of the initial mistakes are going to be made if you're overly ambitious. I would say get the basics right straight out of the gate and gradually build up your expertise and your proficiency so it becomes like muscle memory. If any of you remember what it was like trying to learn to drive a car, you know, the first couple of times were really daunting as you all these things to coordinate. But once you've got into the rhythm of it, it becomes second nature. You know, you're using muscle memory. Filming and storytelling with your camera, particularly with the phone, is very similar to that. You need to get to the proficiency level where you're no longer going into menus going, where was that button? That, you know, that's the stuff that's going yep. to distract and take from your professionalism and distract from the story. So really what you need to do is practice, practice, practice to the point that you're proficient. And then you can start to be ambitious and experiment with moving shots and trick shots and transition shots and all that sort of stuff. But keep it simple at the start. Keep it simple, stupid, as they say. <laughs> Thank you. So I have one last one for you. Um, so how do you shoot a video for both of them and your mobile or social media? How would you say that? Say that to me again. Sorry, the audio just broke up at that exact moment. Okay, so uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sorry. Okay, so one last one for you. Uh, how do you shoot a video for both web and social? Social media, basically, someone has to shoot a video. Okay, great. So uh, again, part of the strategy behind this is what's known as over capture. I may have a slide that I can pull up if you give me a split second. It might, you know, show don't tell. That's exactly what we're talking about here today. And that's exactly what I want to kind of share with you. So let me just see if I can find this slide. And if I can, I'll share it with you. Because this is a strategy that the news organization I used to work in uses all the time. And it basically is the most efficient way of, of shooting with the phone. So if I can hop back in to share my screen one more time, give me a split second. Yeah, and that one there. Okay, hopefully you will see the one that I want to show you. So can you see the screen that has RTE at the top? Yeah. Okay, so let me just explain. So you can see the settings there, okay? They shoot in 4K quality, so four times higher quality than HD and, and high, high megabits, basically high frame rates as well. So there's lots of flexibility in the edit. And from that content, which is shot widescreen, they can create a version for TV news. They can create a version for the website, which is still widescreen. They can create a vertical edit for Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And they can also create an audio report or if you wish a podcast effectively um, from that same media. And this is why, okay? So I don't know if, again, you can see that slide, but that's the difference between HD in the bottom right hand corner and 4K, which is the large screen. It's four times bigger. When you have the 4K media and you're thinking as an overcapture creator, you can do this. You can basically crop HD from any part of that screen, including a vertical crop. So you think to shoot a little bit wider in 4K gives you an awful lot more flexibility in the edit. And if I may be so bold, I'm now just going to give you a very quick example of what that looks like. When people think of street art and they think of Northern Ireland, the thing they think of is you not know, what we're doing here. You can see 
cannot see your video clear. It's still stuck with that the previous slide. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Uh, it actually says stop share for some reason. I don't know why. Let me just try that again. Resume share. Bear with me. Apologies. Everything was working so well. Resume share. Not working. I'm going to stop. I'm going to try one more time. And if it doesn't work, well, we'll just call it quits in it. But uh, nonetheless, let me just. Uh, oh, it's because it's moved off that deck. That's a pity. Yeah, that might not work actually because I've actually I've queued it up for <laughs> I've queued it up for the other deck that I've just showed you. Um, you can share. I'll you yeah, I'll tell you what. Let me let me do it this way because I don't know if I did actually show the final slides. I think I possibly did, but my my Twitter handle is at the end of the deck that I showed you a second ago. And what I will do is I will tweet it basically for anyone. You don't have to follow me. I'll just tweet it out there basically for anyone that wants to see it, and it hopefully will explain it um, properly. I'm not going to share in that case. I'll just hop back over to Zoom. Sorry about that, guys. There's just one other question that's coming in the Q&A, um, Shuvan, from Mickey, about can you share case studies or success stories of businesses that use mobile video pitches to elevate their brand and win new clients or investors? I'm going to give you one if, if I have time. Shuvan, do we have time? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. And not, not a direct answer to that one, Mickey, but just to give you a case study. Okay, so uh, a few years back, I was, I was asked if I could basically help with an event, uh, a large event basically in the States. And they had traditionally brought in uh, TV camera crews to shoot this event. They had, I think, five crews, five full crews um, shooting content at the event. And they always had the content that was shot the day after. So they would come, they would cover some of the keynotes and everything else, and then they'd go off and they'd edit and they'd deliver that footage to be used on social media and stuff the following day. And I have formerly run events myself as well. So I sort of said, look, I can teach a team. If you give me 10 or 15 people from your comms or your social media team, I can teach a team to turn pieces around in one hour, fully branded, completely produced just on their phones or on iPads, if you just let me loose with them. So they brought me over to San Francisco. I had 15 people for a week. And on the course of that week, basically, we came up with different types of content that they would go after at the event. So we kind of defined the specific types of media they would create. And then we went through the... the the essential skill base to create that content and bless the whole team of them. They were all super productive, each one producing content on average on the hour or on the hour and a half, given the fact in the previous model, it was the case that it would actually turn up 24 hours later. I think that was a huge step up in productivity. The brand in question was Oracle and the event that they basically hosted was their open day. Uh, I've forgotten the name, but I think it's Oracle Open World. 50,000 people attend that event. So if you want a way where a big brand is basically used mobile, very, very product, uh, you know, with a lot of productivity and, and quite cleverly, I think that's probably a good example. Thank you so much. So are uh, you going to share uh, that video with us? Yeah, um, let me see if I can. Oh, I don't have the example video to hand. Sorry, I didn't know the question was coming. So no, I can't show you that. But I, what I will do, like I say, I will tweet basically shortly um, the, the example of the, the 4K shoot what's called over capture so you can see how you can use it to do a widescreen and a vertical version from the same edit is that okay yeah certainly thank you so much so uh, with that i'd like to thank our mentors and guests for joining us today and we will be back soon with more workshops thank you so much mentors for joining with us but i would like to bring your attention back on the screen we have recently introduced a referral program at kiwi tech this program rewards anyone who contributes to fruitful introduction to our company. So if you know someone looking for tech development support to scale, join our referral program and follow the mentioned steps shown on your screen or visit our website www.kivitech.com slash referral hyphen program to learn more. Contribute to our journey growth and earn incentives for your trust in us. Till then, take care, stay safe, and thank you and have a great day ahead. Thank you so much for your time, Glenn. My pleasure. Bye-bye.